John 18. Uh, we almost could just say the, uh, the closing prayer and go home because Dusty just preached the sermon. Uh, Dusty gave us the condensed version of what we're going to do in a little more length this morning. So if you get nothing from what I say today, remember what Dusty just said and we'll all be good. Uh, you may not realize because we uh, in Churches of Christ especially are not great about religious holidays. Uh, we don't have a, a command to do that and so we tend to shy away. Uh, and the, the big two, Easter and Christmas, we don't usually do a ton with, but we, we may notice at some point. Uh, today is one of the uh, less known on the main calendar ones to everybody else kind of ones, but it is the day of Pentecost. You may not realize that, but uh, you are here on the day of Pentecost. Uh, there will not be a tongue of fire as far as I know, uh, and you better hope to hear me in English because that's all I got, but uh, here we are. And so I thought what we'd do, since we've been working through the Gospel of John uh, the first part of this year, is to go to what Peter had to say on the day of Pentecost, but go to the source. Uh, now, you'll notice what Peter does uh, in his sermon is he, he quotes Joel, he quotes things that David has said about Jesus, and then he tells a little bit of the story. And for us this morning, we're going to rely heavily on Scripture to tell the story of Jesus. Uh, when we last left off in John, before all the I am's and other things that we've done, uh, Jesus was uh, arrested, uh, and we find him going on trial in John 18. And I've got nothing on the screen, guys. Nothing back? They're working on All right. You're going to see a rarity with me, which is notes. Uh, we jump around a little bit today, so I can't just follow it like normal. So uh, we will look to notes, uh, and you can follow along. Uh, in John 18, uh, and we'll start in verses 19 through 21. John 18, 19 through 21. It says, The high priest then questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. And Jesus answered him, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who have heard me what I said to them, they know what I said. And we see something about the way that Jesus speaks and the way that Jesus teaches is that he spoke openly. Now, throughout scripture, we have light and darkness mentioned, and we even mentioned light and darkness at the beginning of our time this morning. And we generally associate darkness with bad things happening, light with good things happening. And here with Jesus, we can recognize that the things that he is saying are set out in the open. He's not trying to hide them. He's not unsure about them. And for most of us, even if we feel good about what we're saying, even if we feel pure about what we're saying, sometimes we hesitate if we know it's going to be out there for everyone to hear. I will tell you that I'm glad we have the technology to live stream for all of our people who can't be here. Uh, I'm glad we have the technology to live stream because there are a lot of uh, smaller churches around who are not able to do that, that have benefited from us doing this. I will tell you, I enjoyed it a whole lot more when it was pre-recorded than I do knowing it's live. Because if I say something dumb this morning, which is always possible, by the way, uh, it is out there and everyone has heard it. And it's not a fear that I'm going to teach something that's uh, an evil teaching or that I'm going to teach false doctrine. But every now and then, I will say something that's silly, uh, which is, by the way, why you should always be following me in your Bible. Uh, I had someone probably six months ago, that, back when we were all together, that caught something that I messed up on a Wednesday night, and it was just a complete mistake. I totally messed it up, but I was glad she caught it, because I realized people are listening, for one thing, but uh, for Jesus, as he's teaching, he teaches out in the open. Uh, it's not anything secretive, and what he's teaching uh, his closest group, he may not teach all of it to everyone because they're not ready for it, but he's not hiding it from them either. He is willing to go out uh, and teach all the things that he's going to teach. Uh, continuing on in verse 22, uh, it says that when he had said these things, and I think you will find here the reaction often to when something is spoken openly that people don't want to hear or that people don't like the way in which they're hearing it. When he said these things, one of the officers standing by struck Jesus with his hand saying, is that how you answered the high priest? And Jesus answered him, if what I said is wrong, bear witness about the wrong. But if what I said is right, why do you strike me? And so we see also that Jesus didn't just speak openly, he spoke honestly. He was not speaking things that were uh, of an ulterior motive. He was not speaking things that were untrue. He was speaking things that were honest. And what they react to is they don't like it. Uh, and two, they don't like the way in which it was said. 
And as I read this story of Jesus, it sounds pretty familiar to me. Uh, And maybe it probably sounds pretty familiar to you in the way we experience telling the story too. Because there are a lot of people in our world that don't like to hear the things that God teaches, don't like to hear uh, the standards that God has set, the morals that he wants us to live by. People struggle with those ideas. And sometimes their reaction to those is to lash out. Uh, We've already looked at love and hate this morning. How many times when you try to teach a Christian teaching, when you try to explain something that God teaches in Scripture, are you met with something along the lines of, why do you hate people? Why do, you have, why do you Christians have to hate like that? And on the inside, you recognize these teachings of, God's are, the teachings of God, they're not hateful things, but it's so hard to get that across in a way that people understand. And Jesus has this same struggle. What he's teaching is open, what he's teaching is honest, and yet still people are struggling with hearing it. They, they don't want to hear it, they don't want to know it. Uh, yesterday when we were chipping wood uh, at our house, I, I went and rented a wood chipper, And I drove it into my backyard and put it there, uh, and I did everything the guy at the rental place told me to do, and it wouldn't chip wood. And I thought, what am I doing wrong? And my wife did the thing that uh, no man ever wants to see done. She pulled out the instruction manual, uh, and she began to read. Uh, Luckily, I had ear protection on, so I didn't have to listen to anything she was learning. Uh, But she began to read, and she gave me all these different things to try. And sure enough, one of the things she told me to try worked, and we got back to chipping wood, and everything was fine. What is it about us that we just don't want to hear things? And I will tell you, at times that we lash out in anger, the way these these soldiers do, we should step back and think, why am I doing this? Uh, Over the past couple months, there have probably been multiple times that we have wanted to lash out in anger or frustration about something. Uh, We have seen uh, friends who have businesses who have struggled because they've been closed. Maybe some of us have been those people. Uh, We have seen uh, all the things going on in the last week, and we have friends who are in law enforcement, and we say, you don't understand. There are are good people here, and what you're seeing is is a small minority of, of what's going on. And we struggle with all of those things, and people react in anger. And our struggle, probably most of all, is sometimes we do that too, and we don't want it to be picked out when we do either. So as Jesus says what he says, and they react in the way that he reacts, he just reminds them of what he's doing. And what he's doing is speaking honestly and speaking openly, which should be very welcome things in our world. All right, I'm going to try to catch us up here real quick so we can go back. There we go. Uh, Verse 28, we're going to skip down. So after all these things have happened, uh, they lead him uh, from the house of Caiaphas to the governor's headquarters. And we're going to encounter Pilate, which is a familiar character for those of us who know the story. Uh, They themselves did not uh, enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled, but could eat the Passover. These religious leaders, they don't even want to be there, but they know that they need to use this process to get things done. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. So now you've seen they don't even want to go in because they feel like they're going to be defiled if they go in. And now they they know they want him put to death, but they know they can't do it. And so they're willing to use Pilate and the Romans to get those things done. They would use any means necessary to get rid of Jesus. Now, any reasonable people along the way, as they're doing all of these things, should step back and say, Okay, hang on a second. We're taking him to a place we're not even willing to walk inside of. We're taking him to people that we're generally fighting against because we don't like their rule, but now we're making use of their rule to get done what we want to get done. Doesn't that sound like just not really good logic as you look through it? And yet we see that these folks are so intent on silencing Jesus. And it's interesting, his defense was, well, hang on a second, I speak openly here, I speak honestly here. And their struggle is, yes, he does. He does all of those things, and we don't like it. We we don't like that we can't refute what he's saying. We don't like the way he's saying it and where he's saying it. We don't like that people are following it. And so the best thing we can possibly do is silence it. And again, within the world in which we live, the reason there is an MLK memorial that my family went to visit is because somebody in Memphis 50 years ago thought, if I can just silence this man, what he's teaching can stop. And how many times throughout history has that been what people have tried to do? 
They've seen someone who is leading something and they just want to put an end to it. And what they don't realize here in John 18 is they are playing into God's plan. None of this is happening, happening randomly. None of it is happening by accident. All of this is part of the plan of God. Then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. And Jesus answered, you say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate said to him, what is truth? He brought truth. And this is another place where both Pilate and the people around him and everyone in our world today tends to struggle. It is the idea of truth. We live in a world that is edging towards something called postmodernism. You may know this term, you may not. Uh, I don't feel like Ada, Oklahoma is quite there yet. Uh, I feel like there are probably some big cities on the coast that are closer to it than we are. If you go into Europe, you will find this much more clearly. The idea of postmodernism is all these things of God, all of this uh, system of ethics and everything else that we rely on that comes from God is no longer of any importance. What we now have is I decide my truth, you decide your truth. And let me tell you, that doesn't end anywhere we want to go. But that is the world in which we live. And Pilate was foreshadowing that 2,000 years ago. Pilate says, what is truth? And I'm sure in Pilate's mind, there are some things that he thinks are true and some that are not. But those things are for him and for Rome to decide, not, not for this bunch of Jews. But Jesus comes bringing truth. And so when we seek truth in our world, there is one place we can go. It's to the word. It's to the things that were taught by Jesus that bring us truth in life. We can always rely on the fact that they're truth. Down to verse 38. He's gone on with questioning Jesus. And there are questions and statements and responses. And as Pilate goes through all of this, there is just a struggle to see what, what exactly has he done here? This, this seems like a guy who is innocent. I don't really see what the deal is. And in verse 38 of chapter, chapter 18, he says, after he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him. You brought this guy here to be convicted, to be put to death in your minds. I, I've got nothing. There, there is nothing I can see that he's done that's worthy of this. But you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. They did not care about justice. They would try to sell to you and anyone who was around them at this point. It was all about justice. They didn't care about justice. Th this was not about uh, coming to a just decision. This was not making sure that the guilty were punished and the in innocent were freed. They flip-flopped it. Because here is Pilate, who is far from a, a, a religious person in their eyes. And what he has seen clearly is, I have a guilty man who's already imprisoned. And I have an innocent man here you brought before me. And there's a custom here that one of them will be set free. Who should we set free? And I like to think that all of us as followers of Christ would see the obvious answer here. But how often do we take the person that we disagree with, the person that we do not like, and scapegoat them in the name of whatever it is we're interested in? And we're fully ready to align ourselves with people that we know are not good, that we know are not right with God, and we're willing to let the guilty go instead of the innocent. They are not interested in justice in this process. And one of the other things we, we learn about the early church is the early church is. I told you earlier they're multi-ethnic. They're also people that are very interested in justice. And for us as a church, we, we should recognize all of the wrong going on within this. And it's a wrong that is part of the plan of God. Uh, it is a wrong that has benefited in salvation for us. But it is still a wrong that is going on. And they are just trying to get their way through all of it. So skip down to chapter 19, verse 5. So Pilate has been, uh, uh, Pilate has convicted Jesus now at this point, even though he doesn't agree with his guilt. It says that Jesus came out wearing the road of, crown of uh, thorns and the purple robe. Uh, going through my, my pile of wood chips yesterday, uh, I'm wearing gloves that have some sort of a fake leather uh, part to them on, on, the, on, the, on the hand so you can hopefully not get stuck by anything. And I reached into that pile and I grabbed full force a giant vine of thorns. And I was hating life for a moment. And I thought about what we were going to talk about today. Because I have seen the thorns from this area of the world. And as frustrating as ours are, you have no idea. Because the thorns from this part of the world are thorns that are about this long. 
And when one of those pierces into you, you know it. And you cannot ignore it. And they jokingly call him a king and they fashion this crown of thorns. And they don't carefully lay it on his head. They drive that thing onto his head. And Jesus experiences this incredible cruelty. He comes out in this crown of thorns and they've put a robe on him. And this robe that they put on him, it's, it's mocking as well. But if you will consider for a moment what he has been through in the beatings, and we, we didn't look at all of that because we just don't have time this morning, but as he is beaten and whipped and flogged in the skin that just would have been open, and they place that robe on him, which they were later, later tear off, it is all part of the cruelty of this. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, And when I get to the end of this verse, it just makes me upset all over again. Because what they should be crying out from after all this is, okay, our point has been made. Here's this guy we wanted to silence. Look what he's been through at this point. Beaten to the very edge of death. There with the crown of thorns on and the robe being mocked and spit on and hit. It's enough now. But instead, they are the bloodthirsty mob. They are the bloodthirsty mob who says, crucify him, crucify him. Do, do this thing that we can't do because we want it done, but we're going we're gonna to let the Romans do it for us. They wanted violence. Now, this is the complete contrast of the early church that we know in the book of Acts because that is a church that did not strike back. That is a church that was imprisoned. That is a church that was sent running at times, That was a church that did not defend themselves when you want them to stand up sometimes and defend physically and freedom and all of those things. The religious leaders here, they're looking for violence. And they want to see Jesus continue to be punished all the way to the point of death. Skipping down to verse 15. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. They have no king. This is probably the truest thing they have said at this point in the entire story. They have no king. If you will go back to the Old Testament in the time of the Judges, which if you read through the book of Judges, there are some uh, fun VBS stories in there. And there are some stories we like to ignore in there. There's a lot of up and down with the people of God. And at some point in the midst of all that, as they are leaving the time of Judges, they cry out to God because they want a king, and they ask Samuel to go to God on their behalf and go get them kings, largely because all the other nations around them have kings, and they feel like that's what they're supposed to do. And in the midst of all that, God says to them, I'm the king. Are they not satisfied with me as their king? And they spend the rest of the Old Testament answering that question and answering it very clearly. And now again here, toward the end of the life of Jesus, they answer it one more time. We have no king but Caesar. I would ask you, and I know because we're here, or if you're here online, wherever you're at this morning, that we claim Jesus as our king, I would ask you how much our life shows that. Uh, Our youth group was studying on Thursday night together uh, from Matthew 6, uh, about giving and praying and about the things that we give as our offering to God. Uh, And for teenagers who feel like they don't have a lot of money, we we talked a little bit about time and the time that we give. And one of the things I encourage them to do, I'm curious if any of them will actually do it before we get together Thursday again, is to keep a diary this week of how they spend their time. If you were to do that this week, uh, and for a lot of us, we have a little more free time than we used to have, or maybe some of us are busier, it kind of depends. If you were to keep a diary of how you spent your time, what would that look like at the end? If you were to keep a diary of how you spent your money, What would that look like at the end? Uh, If you were to keep a diary of conversations you had and what they were about, what would that look like at the end? And I wonder if some of us might be surprised by what we see. Uh, When I started this weight loss thing back in September, one of the things I have done that's been very helpful to me is I have kept a log of everything I've eaten for about 250 days now. Uh, It's handy for a couple reasons. One, when there's leftovers in the fridge and I have to say, is that still good? When did we make that? I can pull my phone out and I can look at, oh, we ate that on Tuesday. It's still good. We're good to go. The other thing I have found out is I was taking in more than I thought I was taking in or or taking in worse things than I I thought I was taking in, and it caused me to refocus and to realize what I was doing wrong and where to fix that. If we do this, it's the same thing. 
Because how we spend our time, how we spend our money, what we converse about doesn't just say those things. It says who our king is. And for them, they really don't have any king other than Caesar. And if I could amend this, and I don't, don't suggest amending scripture, I'll just amend their words. If I could amend this, we have no king but Caesar and ourselves. Because all of this for them is about self-interest. Caesar, in their mind, is not even really their king. They're just saying what Pilate wants to hear. Their king is themselves. And sometimes, if we write all those things down of our time and our money and our conversations, we will learn in the midst of all that our king is ourselves too. And we have to fight against, because even though we are not crucifying our Lord literally, we are showing him the same value when we do that. Skimming down to verse 26. Jesus now on the cross. They have led him along. He's had to carry his own cross. They've driven the nails in his hands and his feet. He hangs there. I don't know what kind of thoughts would go through your mind at that moment if you were the one crucified, being unjustly put to death in the most cruel way possible. So he hangs there. He looks down. He saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, most likely John. There's a little debate about who the disciple who Jesus loved is, but John is the one who refers to him this way. Most people think it's John. He said to his mother, woman, behold your son. And then he said to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. Even in the midst of all of this, he still had compassion. Whatever challenges we face, whatever struggles we go through, however unjustly we feel like we're being treated, wherever our world does when it comes to Christianity, we still have to be the ones who have compassion. We still have to be the ones who care about others. And I know here with Jesus, it, it starts with the closest to him, with his mother. But his compassion is extending far beyond that. I, I would tell you that I think it's a combination of his obedience to God and his compassion for us that kept him on that cross to begin with. He has compassion in the midst of all this. Then after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, he said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He finished his mission there on the cross. This is what he came to do. And we could try to encompass what Jesus came to do, and Jesus did that himself. He talked about coming to seek and save the lost. Uh, he talked about uh, what he came to do in so many ways. But this is the culmination of what he came to do. But the beauty of God's plan is, even though this is the culmination of what he came to do, this is not the end of the story. If we were reading this book and this book was about people, maybe we'd have a little more about what everybody else did now and how they carried on. But the story of Jesus would be over here. But the story as we know it does not end. In John 20, in verse 1, he's been taken down off the cross toward the end of chapter 19. Uh, he has been taken and laid in a tomb, and they have waited to come back now to the beginning of chapter 20. It says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. We'll learn in the other Gospels that that stone was put before the tomb, that soldiers were there to guard it, that they did everything they could to make sure that the body wasn't stolen, and yet when Mary shows up at the tomb, the stone has been rolled away. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they laid him. Skipping down to verse 9, uh, they come back to the tomb, and they find exactly what Mary explained to them, that this tomb is empty, and, and he's not there. The stone has been rolled away. And as they're trying to make sense of all of this, it says in verse 9 that they did not understand the scripture as yet, that he must rise from the dead. He overcame death. In whatever stories you may look at, I will tell you if there's a story out there where someone overcomes death, that one's just a story. That is fiction, it is storytelling, it is interesting, but it's just a story. For Jesus, as a man who walked the earth, he overcomes death. And everything we have looked at, it's the longer version of what Dusty told us, it's the longer version of what Peter will say in Acts 2. In Acts 2.22, as Peter's speaking, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know. And Peter summarizes everything we have done over the last five months. 
Jesus came to earth. John emphasized probably more than anyone these signs that he did. We looked at the seven major ones that came along. Jesus explained who he was and what he was about. We've looked at that over the last several weeks. And for these people that Peter speaks to, some of them have seen it. And for the ones who haven't seen it, they've at least heard the stories of this man who has come and done things unlike any others. This Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. It was all God's plan. You open up to Genesis chapter 1 and verse verse 1 and you find in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. From before that point, God was planning this. You open up to John 1, and you learn about the, in the beginning, the Word was, uh, was God, and the word, the word was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All of that planned from before time. All of the cruelty that we have talked about, that Jesus experienced, all of the injustice, all of the violence, the death, and then the overcoming of death, all of that in the plan of God before time. And the most incredible thing about all of it is, It's for us. That's not just for us sitting here at 505 West 17th. It's for the people who are watching online. It's for the people who have gone on before. It's for lives that we've celebrated this week. It's for people who struggle in our world. It is for people who we do not even know yet who will come into the world. For all of these people, God has created a plan where we could follow him. And that is the message that Peter preaches in Acts 2. And they ask the question that you cannot help but ask at the end of that. What do we do? When you have learned this unbelievable plan has been set in motion, all you can respond with is what do we do? And we understand that so much in every other aspect of life. When you you come to a point where where you've heard something that you can't fully comprehend, but you know it needs to change you, you want to ask, what do you do? When you come to a point where you don't know what else to do, You just want to ask the question, what do we do? Uh, As good as my wife was with the instructions of the wood chipper yesterday, there came a point where I put a a log in there that was a little too big, and it stopped, and I reversed it out, and then I tried to make it go again, and it wouldn't go. And then I pulled out the manual and tried to read again and figure out if there's something. I tried all the things that Stacy had told me. I tried all the things in the manual I could find. Nothing worked. And finally, I did the thing that no man ever wants to do. I called the place called the rental place and said, here's what it's doing, what do I do? And they said, have you tried this? I said, yep. I said, have you tried this? I said, yep. They said, we're going to send Larry out. I said, all right, Larry's coming. Larry showed up. He said, you try this? I said, yep. He said, you try this? Yep. Larry tried a few other things. Larry jiggled a couple wires on it, and immediately it started working again. And I thought, I wouldn't have even known to try that. As Peter preaches in Acts 2, he is in front of a group of people that have tried everything else. And they would have never even thought that this could actually be true. In the world in which we live, we are in a world that is seeking any other answer besides Jesus. Maybe it's because they don't think this is possible. Maybe they think it's all a book of myths. Maybe they have seen how Christians act somewhere along the way and they've gotten frustrated by that and so they walk away from it all. For whatever reason, they have tried everything else and even if they have convinced themselves it is working, it's not. It is all temporary. And we know that. But how do we say that in a way that shows love to them, in a way that will bring them to ask this question, what do we do? And I will tell you, if we had read through Acts 2 instead, and we didn't because we did that last year, if we had read through Acts 2 instead, you would find that Peter doesn't beat around the bush here. Uh, Peter doesn't, uh, he doesn't make it easy on them. He's pretty much in their face about it. But what we do know about Peter is, because he will write it later in 1 Peter 3, he's doing this in love. And something about him shows them that even in the midst of the conviction, there is love there. And so they want to know what do they do. And for Peter, the answer is clear. Repent and be baptized. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Spirit, and you'll receive the gift of the Spirit. And that answer of what do we do has not changed. It's the same answer today if you were to come to any of us and say, what do I do? 
Repent and be baptized. So this morning, if you're in need of that, we stand ready. This morning, if you are uh, somewhere around the world uh, watching us and you've never heard that before, let this be the time that that study begins for you. Uh, And don't let it wait too long. The, The other thing we learn about Christians, about disciples throughout the New Testament is exactly what we read about the disciples who show up at the empty tomb. They didn't understand yet. You don't have to have all this figured out before you decide. What you need to know is Jesus came, he did amazing things, he loved people, he had compassion, he died for you, he rose again, and the response to that is to follow him. And you can learn along the way. Don't let having to figure it all out stop you from beginning that journey. If you need to come to him for the first time, or if you need to come back to him again, please come while we stand and sing.